In this week's Technique Tuesday video, we'll explore the differences between stretchiness and elasticity when it comes to ribbing patterns so that you can choose the ribbing that makes the most sense for your project. As always, if you'd like to jump right to a specific point in the video, there are direct links down in the description. So when a knitter asks what ribbing is the stretchiest, we need to define a few terms uh, in order to understand what it is that they're looking for and also what it is that we mean when we are responding to that question. So what I have here are four swatches. Uh, they were all knit using the same yarn and the same needles. I cast on the same number of stitches. I worked for the same number of rows. For these swatches, I used a method of casting on that I demonstrated a couple of weeks ago that creates the stitches are live on a lifeline rather than having an actual edge. And then I slipped the live stitches to waist yarn at the end. This is so that we can see exactly how much the fabric and the stitch pattern will stretch uh, without having to worry about the cast on or bind off edge interfering with that. So this one is all, this is stockinette. So all of the stitches on this face of the fabric were knit and all of the stitches on the other face of the fabric were purled. This is knit one, purl one ribbing and you can see that it is narrower. It is not as wide as the stockinette swatch. Same number of knits and purls all together, but I alternated between them as I was working across the row. So I have a knit one, purl one all the way across, but I also have a knit one, purl one all the way across on the other face of the fabric. This is knit two, purl two ribbing. And while I, on one face of this fabric, I start and end with two knits, and on the other face, I start and end with two purls, I still have worked the same number of knits and purls for the entire swatch. And this one here is knit three, purl three. And what you'll see is, as I change my stitch pattern, I get narrower and narrower fabric. This tells us where the fabric is when it's at rest. And these have not been washed or blocked or steamed or anything to relax the fabric. Typically, once you have done something um, to get the fabric wet, whether it's steam or soaking it or something, it will relax the fabric and it won't be as stiff and tight. So it will be a little bit more relaxed. But this shows you what the fabric widths are when they're at rest. So what do we mean when we say something is stretchy? We're talking about whether it is stretchable. Can something be stretched like this? It can get bigger and bigger when you pull on it. That is something that is stretchable. When I let go, this is relaxing back to its original size. That means it's elastic. It will go back to its resting state. Not everything that is stretchable is also elastic. If you think about saltwater taffy, if you've ever seen that being made where you created the sugar mixture and it needs to be pulled. So you stretch the mixture and then you fold it under to, to make it half as long as it was and then you can stretch it again and you fold it under and pull on it again. So you're pulling it and you're stretching it but it is not elastic. So these pieces of knitted fabric are elastic because they will go back to their relaxed state. Stockinette is a very flat fabric. Um, so it is perfectly flat. The edges want to curl because it's stockinette, but it's a very flat fabric. We can look this way and we can see how flat it is. So let's look at knit one, purl one ribbing. What's happening here is that the fabric is sort of corrugated looking. When you put a column of knits adjacent to a column of purls, the purl column will recede and the knit column will come forward. And that causes, that causes three things to happen. One, it causes um, the purls, when they recede, that means that the running threads that are, that are attaching the two stitches will come out of the back of the knit stitch and through the front of the purl stitch. That's going to shorten that running thread and it's also going to make it vertical. So the, so the running thread is not going this way and now it's coming this way, so it's vertical. So those things cause the fabric to then contract in. But the other thing that it does is because 
because those stitches, the purls recede and the running thread gets vertical, it's a shorter distance between the two stitches than it is if they're side by side. And so when it shortens that running thread between the two stitches, that creates slack, which then moves itself into those stitches. So if you look at these knit stitches, they're larger than the stockinette stitches. They're a lot larger. And that's because of the interaction of the knits and purls and what happens with the running thread and the vertical nature of the space between the two stitches rather than a horizontal space between them. So that's going to cause um, this swatch to get narrower. One other thing about that slack between the stitches is that because we're alternating every other stitch, that means every stitch is getting some slack from each of its neighbors. So this stitch is getting slack from uh, its neighbor to the right and to the left. This is knit to purl two ribbing and you can see that it is even narrower than the knit one purl one ribbing. The differences here are that these stitches aren't nearly as big as those stitches. They're closer in size to the stockinette, not quite the same size, but they're closer. And that is because each of these stitches only has one neighbor that it's getting extra slack from. So this knit stitch has only one purl neighbor and this stitch has only one purl neighbor. Otherwise they have a neighbor that's a knit. And what you'll see here is that the fabric gets more corrugated. It becomes more three dimensional. This is very flat. This is less flat, this is even less flat. So part of the contraction here has to do with how much vertical um, space that this fabric is taking up. And finally, I have knit three purl, purl three fabric and you can see that this is even narrower than the knit two purl two. And you can see that it's even more three dimensional than the knit two purl two fabric is. And what's happening in this case is you have those knit stitches in the middle are, aren't getting any extra slack um, from its neighbors. You have this knit stitch is kind of on a horizontal plane and then the stitches on the side are traveling down this way and then you have that purl column in the center that has no stitches that are different on either side of it. So that's why you get this up and down. You get a very um, three-dimensional fabric with that. So when we have stockinette fabric and we want to, it will stretch and it will stretch if we anchor it because the edges are live stitches and not cast on bound off, we can stretch it uh, to its maximum. It, it will stretch um, really, really far. There's no, nothing keeping it from stretching. And you'll see what happens is that the rows will contract uh, in order to allow the stitches to get wider. So here's the knit one, purl one. And we can stretch this one as well, just as far. And so for the knit two, purl two, you can see I can stretch that one just as far. And with the knit three, purl three, I can stretch this one just as far. So these can all stretch to the same maximum amount. So any of these uh, will stretch to a maximum width. It doesn't matter whether you use stockinette or ribbing. You would probably choose ribbing at the edge of a project in order to prevent the stockinette from rolling, but in terms of which one has more ability to stretch, the answer is none of them do. The difference though is in how much they stretch from how wide they are in their relaxed state. So the Knit 3 Pearl 3 was certainly narrower and so it went to the same width, but it, it was more dimensional this way as well. So it loses that dimensionality as it gets stretched and it becomes just as flat. So the limiting factor typically in terms of how much a fabric can stretch is whether it has a, a cast on or bind off edge and how much that edge uh, constricts it. Because if I pull on this, I can, um, the, the cast on edge is going to stop at some point where the fabric would be able to still continue going. Um, and to a lesser extent, my cast on edge is limited, uh, although I have more control over that than a, a standard bind off. So the sock I'm wearing is an example of an item where you need sort of maximum stretch, but it really doesn't matter what ribbing you use. So you choose the one 
that you that most appeals to you in terms of knitting it and as well as the way that it looks so you might choose something that blends well into the stitch pattern that you're using for the rest of the leg but the important thing is that it doesn't matter which ribbing you choose uh, for this they'll all stretch the same amount and the limiting factor is going to be your cast on edge not the ribbing itself Knitters are not always looking for something that's going to stretch the maximum amount. Sometimes what they want to know is what is going to pull in the most. And that's when you can look at these different ribbings and make a decision about that. So if I'm knitting a sleeve, for example, and the sleeve is bigger around than my actual arm, when I switch to the ribbing that I'm going to use for the cuff, the ribbing I choose is going to pull in a different amount depending on which stitch pattern that I choose. So if I have a pretty close fitting sleeve, I could really use any of them and none of them will contract fully. They'll be a little bit stretched out in order to conform to the circumference of my wrist because they're all going to contract some amount. But if I have something that's pretty loose, I might want something that contracts more in order to, to, to stop the looseness and create a bloused effect. Or I might want something that doesn't contract a lot and it actually keeps that looseness and will kind of be somewhat contracted but a little bit looser as it comes down um, my hand further. So it just depends on what it is you're looking for. This gives you an idea of which ones have the most elasticity in, in terms of seeing how much they pull in when they're relaxed versus uh, how much they can stretch out. So this one wins in terms of uh, from its narrowest to the widest point but they all go equally to the, the same widest point when they have the same number of stitches. Ribbing has many purposes. One is in its utility in preventing stockinette edges from rolling. We've seen that all ribbing can stretch equally well, so how the ribbing behaves in its relaxed state may be more important to your project. The choice of ribbing you make for your project will ultimately depend on the number of stitches you need in the pattern repeat, as well as which ribbing you find visually appealing and which one you enjoy knitting. If you have any comments or questions about today's video or suggestions for videos you'd like to see in the future, you can leave those down in the comments below or join the discussion in my Ravelry group, Rocks Rocks. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.